Welcome folks, thanks for joining us. We're gonna give it just a few more minutes as uh, other attendees uh, join the webinar. We'll, we'll get started shortly. Great, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for being here, making time out of your afternoon. My name is Amy Cunningham. Uh, I am uh, the Deputy Director of the Vermont Arts Council and I also serve as the coordinator for the Vermont Creative Network. And you are here today for our, the last in our series of Vermont Creative Network advocacy sessions. Uh, and today's topic is creative economy legislation updates from Washington. We open all of our public events at the Arts Council with a land acknowledgement to recognize that the land we stand on is the traditional unsurrendered territory of the Abenaki people, one of five Wabanaki nations who have had a continual and enduring presence here since time immemorial. We acknowledge their ancestors, their history and their presence, which continues to this day. So thanks again for being here. Uh, a few items of housekeeping. This event is being live captioned by White Coat Captioning. To view the captions during the event, click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Then click on show subtitles to view the captions on your screen. You could also choose to view a full page text of the captions by clicking on the link that my colleague Deirdre is, has just posted in the chat. Thanks Deirdre. This will open the captions in a separate browser for you to view if you like. Um, You'll see there's a chat function here. So feel free to use that to uh, say hello and to answer any questions. We'll mostly take questions uh, at the end of the session, but if there's anything, I'll be monitoring the chat. If there's anything that per that's pertinent that comes up in the, the middle of Narek's presentation, uh, we'll address those as we can, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for the questions. You can also use that chat function to communicate any kind of tech issues you may be ha uh, having. And, and my colleague, uh, Deirdre Connolly, will try to help you there. So today's session is, uh, we've got lots of creative economy news to report out of, out of Washington and a, uh, a full alphabet soup of different bills to decipher. And I'm really pleased to have Merrick Rome 
as our special guest here today to do that with us. Uh, Narek serves as the Vice President of Governmental Affairs and Arts Education at Americans for the Arts. Uh, he uh, leads advocacy efforts, grassroots campaigns, policy development, and national coalition building efforts. Uh, we're really grateful to have Narek here, not only because of his deep expertise in all things related to arts and creative sector policy, but also because Narek is a Vermonter at heart, uh, and we wish we could host you here, Narek, in person. Uh, Narek is a UVM grad. Uh, his parents lived here for a long time, interned for Senator Leahy, worked on Governor Dean's presidential campaign, and has all sorts of other connections to Vermont, and was, and was smart enough to uh, take a job uh, now where your headquarters are on Vermont Avenue, I believe, too. So your Vermont connections run deep. We're really glad you're here. Really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Narek. Great, thank you, Amy. Uh, and as Amy said, I am—I I have a real soft spot for uh, being able to virtually join you today. Uh, and I did move from uh, Church Street in Burlington in 2004 to Vermont Avenue in Washington, D.C. to my current job. Uh, and as I was um, interviewing for the position, I went into the uh, Vermont coffee shop, it was called, on the street. And they had pictures of Killington and Stowe and Sugarbush, big posters on the, I was like, wow, what, this is an incredible, you know, coffee shop to be possibly working across the street from. And unfortunately, the people who owned it had no idea what posters they had on their wall. It had been some previous owners. Uh, and so the mojo of the place was uh, quickly lost uh, for me. But uh, I'm uh, happy to join you. I want to share uh, what I will present today um, with you. So uh, as Amy introduced, I'm uh, simply put a lobbyist for the arts and arts education in at Americans for the Arts. And there's a couple of us uh, in Washington that do lobbying, uh, federal, actual federal lobbying, uh, which typically you know, is something to be considered with a, a note of caution in terms of special interest groups and all in Washington and uh, sometimes the swamp uh, that it is portrayed as. Uh, hopefully, uh, the work that I do in Americans for the Arts does, uh, it's representing artists, entrepreneurs in the arts, small businesses in the arts, uh, the Vermont Arts Council and uh, its peers uh, across the country, other state arts agencies and local arts agencies. Uh, that is our membership group, and we are we work to try and increase resources uh, of all kinds, but certainly in the government affairs side, the public resources, public funding in uh, to arts organizations and uh, to those uh, in the creative workforce. And so uh, I wanted to provide a little bit of an introduction to federal arts advocacy uh, as it exists. I mean, you probably are well aware that uh, that in Washington, D.C., there's a lobbyist for every kind of interest. There's interest groups, there's associations for all kinds of parts of the workforce, um, and that is certainly true for the arts. I work with uh, government affairs staff at the museums, American Alliance of Museums, the League of American Orchestras, all the different arts education discipline groups, music, dance, theater, visual arts, and media arts. Uh, and the list uh, goes on, uh, but roughly told, uh, there's about 30 different advocates uh, at, operating in the national space, the federal space, uh, that uh, where we try to stay coordinated, we try and pursue uh, in a strategic way, um, because uh, policy change in a strategic way, because there are many, many other forces uh, out there that are trying to um, influence the, the congressional process and what the administration does. And so we know that we are under-resourced and understaffed uh, as compared to other similar sectors. Uh, those, the business interest groups uh, have dozens of lobbyists uh, for every one of us. And so that is uh, it's sort of a sense that we have and we see those forces at work. Um, and but what we do have that often the other interest groups don't have is uh, the arts are everywhere. Uh, community arts serve communities, and that happens in every state and in every community in every state. 
uh, sometimes with, you know, huge economies uh, like in Los Angeles and New York City and Chicago, but also in states like Vermont. And we spent a lot of time focused on the Midwestern states, the Western states, where our efforts to demonstrate how the arts exist and flourish in some parts of those Western states, uh, how that takes place and how those policymakers should know that that is something that, uh, that they should support. So that's a little bit about federal arts advocacy and I'll, I, I'm happy to describe that even further. But in terms of the rest of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about the status of Congress. Uh, I will um, summarize what Amy was uh, pointing to in her introduction is there is now more uh, creative economy legislation being proposed than at any other point in US history. And that sounds like a huge statement, uh, but it is true. And, and these are pieces of legislation that are specifically pointed towards supporting the art sector. And I'll describe those in more detail. And then lastly, uh, I'm pleased to give you a, a, what we could call a sneak peek at some uh, upcoming federal resource guides. We've had a set of these around for about 15 years uh, and we've just updated them and they uh, hopefully offer some guidance uh, on how uh, Vermont arts organizations and, uh, and, and organizations like that across the country can be um, well, uh, can understand a little bit better about pursuing federal grants and federal sources of support uh, uh, in ways that from agencies that you may not have been familiar with in the past. Um, everyone or many arts leaders and arts organizations are familiar with the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, but this is about other federal agencies and um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail as well. So um, in terms of the current st status of Congress, uh, it's not really uh, a wonderful day uh, every day uh, watching Congress. And if you're watching any of the news channels, um, you can see some of the worst of it taking place, uh, certainly on these days right now in terms of um, member versus member um, attacks. Uh, you can see a, a lot of partisanship taking place. Uh, we are in year one, office, obviously, of the Biden uh, administration, and we are also watching uh, an effort by the Democrats to singularly uh, move um, some very big pieces of legislation. To put it into context, uh, I typically work on the Fed, each year's federal appropriations cycle. Like every state budget, there's a, you know, from January till May or so in Vermont, there's a state budget that goes through the House and the Senate and hopefully gets to the governor at some point uh, signed into law for the following fiscal year. Federal government does the same thing, starts in the spring, goes through the summer, and hopefully they haven't done it by the deadline of September 30th in many, many years, but somewhere in the fall, uh, they come up with some version of passing the annual budget. Uh, and uh, right now, and, and that is a usually somewhere around a trillion dollars. That is what the federal budget is, depending on how you count it. Uh, that is literally fourth on the priority list right now passing the annual budget. First was that bipartisan infrastructure legislation that did just pass and was signed into law uh, that took uh, place through the summer and, and now just finished up last month. Uh, that was the first item uh, to because that had significant bipartisan support. It was about a 66 to 23 vote in the Senate. It, we haven't, that's the most bipartisan vote on the largest piece of legislation we've seen in decades or in certainly a decade. Uh, in the House, it was much more narrow. It was just a handful of votes. And even since then, uh, Republicans have claimed in the House have claimed that uh, it was the Democrats that if you voted for it, you're giving it away to the Democrats and it wasn't a bipartisan, which left, I think, a lot of Republican senators wondering, what are you guys talking about? Uh, but anyway, so that bill has now um, become law and that's roughly a $900 billion infrastructure bill that hopefully I know that um, your Vermont delegation has sent out press releases explaining why it is good for Vermont, what kind of projects will be undertaken. Uh, and um, uh, so that's sort of now in the rear view mirror, although it, it, it will be projects and funding that will take place over five to 10 years. Uh, 
what is still left to do are two other things. Um, the debt limit, every uh, couple of years, you hear about the debt limit being increased so that, and that takes an act of Congress to do. Uh, and that is a, uh, a critical item because um, no one wants the US government to default on its debt. And then the uh, third uh, major item in front of the annual appropriations is the Build Back Better uh, proposal or uh, the Build Back Better plan as proposed by the Biden administration. And in this particular piece of legislation, which is a uh, right now somewhere around a trillion dollars, perhaps a little less, uh, that is a proposal that because of the nature of the policies it is seeking to promote has become a Democrats only piece of legislation. It is not a bipartisan piece of legislation, although many pieces in it have been in previous constructions bipartisan. Uh, but in order for the Democrats to, to move this legislation, they're using something called reconciliation, which is a uh, Senate procedure that allows just a simple majority to pass the legislation. Uh, within that bill, um, there are some elements. There's nothing that is uh, screams arts legislation or arts policy, but there are many provisions in there that would help uh, those who work in the creative workforce in the sense of uh, gaining uh, more education uh, and having support, uh, federal support for that, uh, child care, allowing uh, parents to um, be able to uh, uh, work full time. Um, there are other developing elements, uh, and I say developing because it is very much still <laughs> being negotiated, uh, but it is, it is a piece of legislation that we are watching to see how the final pieces come out. Um, and there may be some tax provisions that artists uh, and the creative workforce also will care about and will be, that would be a whole nother presentation at some point. So that's the uh, third big piece of legislation. And then you get to the federal, uh, the annual appropriations uh, as well, which is unheard of. And if you put all those together, you're looking at over $3 trillion worth of spending. And I didn't even mention what took place in March, the American Rescue Plan, which was uh, $1.2 trillion, I believe. So uh, just in this year, it has, um, there's been a lot to be following. It's sort of mind-blowing for uh, advocates like myself that see these, the, these nut amounts uh, and um, there's definitely been some ups and downs in the process and none of the process has been really uh, the way it should go in, in terms of the, um, how a bill becomes a law, the ABC schoolhouse rock version uh, of legislation. But that is um, the kind of, that is the status of Congress right now. Uh, and of course, um, just simply put, there's a lot of politics involved. There's a midterm coming up next year and Democrats are worried about that. Republicans are very eager uh, to see the outcomes from that. And that is helping shape what is incredibly a, you know, a split Senate uh, at 50-50 and a uh, House with about a five vote margin that Dem Democrats hold. So that's the status of Congress. Now, within that, those are headlines. Those are things you see on the front pages. Those are the things you'll, you can see on cable news right now. But inside of that, and perhaps far below on a lower, uh, sort of a lower key level, there are uh, pieces of legislation that we should care about, that the art sector should care about, that the Vermont Arts Council should care about, uh, and that artists and small businesses in the arts should care about. And I'll now um, explain that a little bit further once I share my screen again. So uh, this is a very inartistic uh, diagram of the various pieces of uh, legislation. Uh, and I did this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, surprise, surprise, it, it is at my design. Um, but it is an effort to try and capture uh, some of the moving parts around eight pieces of legislation, uh, most of which have been introduced and some of which are about to be introduced. Some of these bills, each one of these circles is a, a congressional bill. Um, and I had to use acronyms just for the sake of uh, being able to put them inside these circles, but I have the full names of the bills spelled out uh, on the bottom of the page. And what the sizes uh, 
of each of these, the colors don't mean anything, but the size of each of the circles is my effort to try and scale the bill to the amount of policies being impacted. So for example, if you look down at star in the bottom right there, that is the Saving Transit Art Resources Act. Uh, and believe me when I say that uh, sponsors of legislation spend a lot of time coming up with the acronyms so they can be catchy, memorable. And if you have a good acronym, hopefully you've got a great bill and it has great success in passing and so on. Uh, but in terms of uh, the STAR Act, that is a bill around doing one thing, which is to remove a, a current prohibition that is in infrastructure funding. So I mentioned the, this huge infrastructure bill. Uh, when the last infrastructure bill went through in 2015, a prohibition was put into place, and this was before we were working on this issue, uh, that blocks federal dollars from coming to Vermont and Vermont Department of Transportation or other agencies that may be public works that may be working on infrastructure projects, it blocks them from using federal dollars in hiring artists or design teams on those, on those transportation projects. So I happen to know that when I learned about this topic, one of the examples at the time was Vermont's use of federal dollars on transportation uh, projects in the state um, to increase the engagement either with cultural amenities or uh, through the art, the design um, of these projects. So for example, on 89 going north, you've got the rest stop there. I don't remember what it's called, the name of it, but there is an entire uh, arts uh, exhibit and public art there. That would not be possible under the current law. And so this STAR Act is a simple bill that is designed to remove that prohibition. Uh, so it does one thing and therefore it is this small circle right here uh, that is um, one of the pieces of legislation around trying to um, increase support for the creative economy. Uh, the PLACE Act, as you can see in the middle here, is the largest one. That is a 45 page bill that covers about eight different areas of workforce policy. Uh, and education and, and some other um, elements around uh, the um, uh, wor workforce uh, and how it can support th those in the creative workforce. And so because that covers so many different policy areas, I made it a bigger cir circle. And then the overlaps, I tried to organize it in a way that can give some sense of one, how these overlap, but don't they are not duplicates of each other. We do not have eight different bills that are doing all the same thing. Uh, some are direct grants to artists. Uh, some are around economic development and, jo and in creating jobs and supporting small businesses in the arts. And then uh, two are uh, focused on tax policy. And one is squarely uh, the AEFA, Arts Education for All Act, uh, is, is the newest one that was introduced just last month. Uh, and that is uh, around arts education and changing federal education policy so that arts education can be better supported. So taken as a group, these are uh, represent more federal congressional bills than ever at one point. Um, some of these are brand new ideas. Some of them are ideas that have been around the um, AMPA, Artists Museum Partnership Act, that small one on the left, is a bill that Senator Leahy has been the sponsor of in the Senate. And that bill has been active for over 15 years. The reason why it's still here is because tax policy is, takes years to move. Uh, and it takes even longer when the last tax bill, which was done in 2017, uh, was a partisan tax bill. And that's not a, an opinion. That is, there were no Democrats um, that helped form that tax bill uh, that provided a lot of tax cuts. In this case, this would uh, the Artist Museum Partnership Act is, is um, Senator Leahy, uh, and it was in the House, it was sponsored by Sen uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis, the um, uh, now past member from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, they introduced this bill to address um, 
a shortcoming in tax policy that prevents artists who are visual artists in this case uh, from donating their work and receiving a fair market to tax deduction for it. Right now, if you're an artist and you um, have a painting that you'd like to donate, you can only get the amount of the materials, the canvas, the paint that you spent. That's all you can take as a deduction when you give it to a collecting institution. But if uh, Amy was a collector uh, and she bought it from the artist for 5,000, 10,000, whatever amount, that would be the amount that she could deduct uh, if she gave it to the same collecting institution or museum. And so this bill would address uh, that inequity and, and try and help artists um, receive that same financial benefit. And so each one of these, uh, each one of these bills has a legislative story to it. It has a legislative, legislative history, and it also has sponsors and how they came to be sponsors in the Senate and the House. Uh, some of them have not been, they've been introduced in previous Congresses. Uh, the Place Act and the Create Act are uh, two bills that uh, have been introduced in previous Congresses and will be introduced again this month, I believe. Uh, they've been revised uh, from their previous versions so that they were uh, essentially better positioned to be considered by this Congress and this administration. And that happens with uh, lots of these bills over time. Uh, I will sort of pause there on each one of these and maybe come back to if there's questions about each one of these. Um, what I wanted to just segue to from the policy discussion is what are we doing about all of this and, and what can advocates around the country be doing about this, including in Vermont? It, it, the Vermont answer is simple. And I, can, I say this with confidence because as Amy said, I have uh, uh, great familiarity with Vermont, having gone to school here, lived there. Uh, I was also um, uh, helped organize a Vermont State Society down here in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's a state society, I think, for every state. There wasn't one for Vermont when uh, President Obama was elected, and, and a bunch of us uh, former Vermonters uh, were sitting around saying, when it's inauguration time, uh, there will be no Vermont ball celebrating Barack Obama's election. Uh, and so we put together this Vermont State Society, had a wonderful uh, Vermont State Society inaugural ball, uh, and did it again four years later. Uh, and then we did not do it again four years after that, and there hasn't been one uh, since. Hopefully, uh, there will be one uh, soon again. So... In terms of this set of uh, policy proposals, uh, we've been working with the congressional offices and many of uh, the organizations like Americans for the Arts that have been championing these bills for years. For example, that other tax bill, PATPA, uh, the Performing Artist Tax Parity Act, is one that has been championed by Actors' Equity, uh, the labor group, uh, for many years uh, because it would address a, uh, a tax deduction uh, problem that has occurred now uh, and per their membership uh, performing artists uh, have business expenses that uh, no longer receive a tax deduction. That's something that would be addressed by that act. And so that organization and many of the other organizations that have been working uh, with congressional offices and advocates around the country, uh, we are trying to coordinate uh, all of this at once. Uh, and it's been a busy time frame because of all the COVID legislation that uh, has been uh, considered last year and this year. And now with this reconciliation bill, possibly in its final month or so, uh, we're looking towards 2022 and what legislation is considered next year uh, and that hopefully that these bills, and if not these bills, the provisions in these bills will find uh, vehicles to attach themselves to. Uh, and that's the kind of work that the other uh, national arts advocates and I do. Uh, we look for moving vehicles, moving legislation, and try and work to get these provisions into those bills. So now in Vermont, uh, you have literally uh, one of the best congressional delegations in the country in, as measured by pro-art support. I already mentioned 
Uh, Senator Leahy is being one of the sponsors of th these bills, and he's been a co-sponsor on several of these other bills over the years. Um, Congressman Welch uh, has um, was just thinking recently um, was the House sponsor of what was called the Shuttered Venue Operating Grant Program, uh, which was a 17 billion with a B, 17 billion dollar uh, relief source for performing arts venues. And I know Vermont uh, organizations received uh, those that applied received. Um, support through that. Uh, and then uh, Senator Sanders, I was about to say Congressman Sanders, because I knew him then as well. Senator Sanders uh, has um, been uh, both, I mean, going back to his time as mayor, I suppose, uh, has been pro arts. Uh, and as he's leader of the budget committee now in the Senate, and much of his budget priorities help support many of the programs that, for instance, this Place Act uh, would would address and the tax changes and things like that. Um, so in terms of those three, uh, there's Vermont is well placed in Congress to be leaders on all of these items, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, thinking brought more broadly uh, beyond Vermont's borders, uh, the kind of work that we're doing, around these, the creative economy is to both introduce these topics, uh, introduce phrases like the creative economy, believe it or not, that's still news to a lot of folks. Um, we seek to try and further uh, some of the federal studies of the creative economy. So the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BEA at the US Department of Commerce has an actual account, uh, an annual measure of how much the creative economy, uh, what percentage of gross dom domestic product that is each year in the United States. And it breaks it out by state as well. Uh, and uh, nationally, it's 4.3% of GDP is the creative economy. And that is for-profit and non-profit, 4.3%. Now that sounds, that's a small number, right? It's a single digit. It's on the lower end of single digits. Uh, but that single digit is still bigger than uh, the transportation industry. 4.3% is bigger than the agriculture industry uh, and other industries as well that you may think are you know, um, larger than 4.3% of GDP. And transportation, agriculture, they have federal agencies dedicated to supporting those industries. There is a US Department of Transportation. There is a US Department of Agriculture. There is no US Department of Creative Economy, which is the, exactly the kind of work that and attention that we're trying to build around this set of policies. So when you think about what does it take for a creative economy to flourish, it roughly, in large part, are many of the same issues that any small business needs access to capital, perhaps access to education, uh, an educated workforce, or the ability to, to pursue uh, and develop a workforce and the other support systems that a healthy workforce needs. Um, healthcare was uh, another issue during consideration of the uh, Affordable Care Act that arts organizations were active around um, because artists and those in creative economy have a higher percentage of being mobile and not having employer-based healthcare as an option. And so that was something that received a lot of attention. And so right now, because of uh, the having these bills together, we are trying to build co-sponsorship and attention to these bills. We're trying to ask arts organizations to endorse them if they can endorse. Uh, not every organization can if you're a state agency. That may not be an appropriate role um, for endorsement, but you can educate uh, your membership around uh, these bills. Um, and then as advocates, as individuals, uh, you can contact your members of Congress and ask them to be co-sponsors. And as I said, in Vermont, uh, your congressional delegation is very predisposed to supporting these um, and when asked. And, um, but it is, our work is cut out for us in the Western uh, states uh, where there, is, there are not population centers that scream creative economy and, and, and have Broadway theaters or, or have a Broadway. Uh, and so that's a lot of the education that we do. 
um, and a lot of the work outreach that uh, I do with my colleagues, um, both at Americans for the Arts and the other arts advocacy groups is to encourage uh, their members uh, in targeted locations to reach out to those senators or those members of Congress in the House who serve on committees that would oversee the consideration of these bills. Uh, and those are some of the basic ways that we're right now getting started on building support for this. We are seeking to have either roundtables or hearings on these bills in the Senate and the House is another activity that we're pursuing. Um, we are working with the Biden administration uh, to try and increase their staffing attention. As I mentioned before, there is no Department of Creative Economy. There is one for transportation. There is one for agriculture. Those are smaller financial sectors than the creative economy, and they have agencies. That sounds like I'm uh, you know, a little pointed there. Th this is the arguments that we've been making in the last few years as we have uh, these uh, financial measures of the economic impact of the arts. And there's also, this is the, the one that I'm citing is from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, but there are other ones, uh, which is the BEA study, by the way, is the platinum level measure of the creative economy. And there's nothing greater than that in a national sense. There are smaller ones, regional ones, state-based ones that are also helpful for educating state leaders around their investment into state arts agencies and other uh, cultural support agencies uh, as well, uh, not just at the federal level, but then these uh, smaller, more focused ones. And I know that Vermont has been, uh, has both used this data uh, and you both used it in terms of year to year, but also used it for uh, building a vision of a creative economy in Vermont in a long-term way. And that is, uh, that, that kind of foresight and policy focus is incredibly helpful uh, to Vermont's ongoing economic development uh, and job scene, uh, especially when the creative, the creative economy in Vermont uh, is as strong as it is compared to other states uh, and per, per capita. Uh, so I'll stop there on this particular item and, and happy to answer questions on it. Um, and I'll just end with, I mentioned uh, having a little bit of a preview, uh, well, a preview of two things. This uh, amateur diagram that I've been showing you will hopefully be improved soon by something that looks a little bit more like this. This is just a draft version, but we'll have a couple more pages that will explain each one of the bills in a, a more formal way. Uh, we're working with a design firm around that. And then also it will describe a little bit more about the equity focus of these bills and addressing uh, some of the gaps in support that we've identified. Uh, and then also how it impacts workers and businesses uh, and um, addresses education uh, and then some of the other impacts as well. Uh, but what I wanted to show you is also uh, uh, something I'm called sorry, our- Laura, I'm sorry, before you jump yep. into that, can I just pitch a question from the chat that I think is relevant to the, that previous research? Um, Meg was curious about any, you had those kind of filters around equity and workforce development as it relates to that creative sector legislation. And Meg's question is around, any of the legislation that you see overlapping around the creative economy and environmental issues? Uh -huh. So, uh, yes. And so there's two sides to this coin. Uh, there is not, well, let me start uh, this direction. Uh, we have more work to do in terms of environmental policy in every direction at the federal level, uh, not specific to the arts in that case. Uh, this reconciliation bill and the infrastructure bill that just took place uh, has, has begun to try and address some of the very big questions around uh, uh, federal environmental policy, trying to address the um, energy efficiency, trying to address uh, green energy. In terms of the arts and environment, we do not have any, there are no bills uh, in this lineup right here uh, that are addressing that. Uh, that's simply from a case of, it has not uh, been an area that we've developed. Uh, and I say sort of the, the, the greater we, um, but the area that we have focused in on, uh, and that's actually where I was heading was in our resource guides, 
we have a new um, uh, we have a new resource guide around arts and the uh, Environmental Protection Agency that I wanted that um, I'll share in a second. So the reason why I say there's two sides to this is one trying to change current policy so that the arts can be seen as a solution to tackling broader environmental causes uh, and policy. And then the current resources that are available at the EPA and other federal agencies in how the arts or arts leaders can be resourced to address uh, either through public art or any other kind of engagement. Um, some of the raising visibility around the dangers of climate change uh, and um, that kind of approach. So there's one that is about policy change and the other side being around um, how we can direct um, interest in resources uh, in the arts and the environment. And that's uh, one of the resource guides is guides I'm about to share. That's great. Thank you, Narek. And if I might quickly, I just want to reference, um, you were talking about the BEA research. I wanted to let folks know I put a link to that uh, in the chat. And then I'm also going to place a link uh, Narek was mentioning the, the more specific research that's been done in Vermont and New England. And I'm putting a link now um, from our Create BT Action Plan where folks can read um, a pretty great summary of uh, kind of the a lit review of the creative economy research uh, for Vermont as it stands. And if there's other questions, uh, I haven't always been able to open up the chat when I've been sharing, but please raise them, Amy. Um, I did want to... Uh, also referenced the Create Vermont plan from the summer. Uh, you should know, I mean, Amy may, may very well be aware of this, but just so uh, anyone else listening uh, should know that having a plan like that and Vermont's plan is uh, miles ahead of many other states uh, in trying to just um, formally discuss and capture where Vermont is, where the state is right now in terms of the creative economy and talking about where it wants to go. That sounds like a simple kind of discussion. It, and it is not, uh, and it certainly isn't at the state level. And Vermont is many, uh, you know, far ahead of many other states in, in that discussion. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, it is an enormously helpful tool for both um, having a discussion about what's happening in Washington around the creative economy, because you have a sense of um, the kind of um, policy support that you might need or would best benefit from should policy change be possible in Washington. Uh, and um, I think that is um, in, a very positive um, path to, to be on. And I wish that there were some other states that would also be on that path because it would help crystallize for their elected officials uh, how that um, both the creative economy, the jobs engine in their state actually could be supported further and benefit further from some of these um, proposals. Thank you, Narek. Now, there are not currently any other questions in the chat. Uh, just a shout out that your bubble diagram is great. So I thought you would want <laughs> to hear that. Um, but just an encouragement to folks to, um, to please um, feel free to, to pitch any questions you like in the chat. I'll turn it back over to you, Narek. Sure. So the, the last thing I was going to uh, share is uh, this introduction to um, our resource guides. Now, about uh, 12 years ago or so, um, we published a set of guides. They um, were named uh, in similar titles, and it was an effort to try and uh, provide very introductory uh, booklets around, yes, you know about the National Endowment for the Arts, but maybe you haven't done any work at the U.S. Housing and Urban Development Agency around their Community Development Block Grant Program or um, around the National Service Program at uh, AmeriCorps. Um, the very first one we did, as a matter of fact, was around, at the time, the Pentagon, of all places, to talk about art support, the Pentagon was closing down a whole bunch of military bases around the country. And that was a huge process. And and it's part of the deal, so to speak, for them to close down like a hundred different military installations was to then fund the development of those installations into something new. So they would be used and they could be turned over to the community in which they were housed. And so we saw that at the time as a big opportunity for uh, 
restore for retired aircraft ca carriers like they have in New York and San Francisco uh, and other places around the country to be turned into museums. Uh, we saw it for um, federal, uh, for military bases to be turned into cultural installations uh, or to have that as part of their redevelopment. And so we wrote a, a resource guide around it. So that was a while back. And uh, while federal government uh, moves slowly, it does move uh, from time to time. And so what I'm showing you now are six new guides that we're about to publish later this month uh, that are in these six different areas. And one of which uh, I thought would be certainly of importance to Vermont, the one, I mean, they all would be, they all are applicable and there, you can see the one on environmental protection uh, there as well. The one on rural development uh, is important because it has uh, a focus on small populations, 20,000 and below, of which I know Vermont has many. Uh, and that is, um, so it's specific to that. Each one of these guides comes with uh, examples of other arts organizations that have accessed these dollars. So, because one of the sort of real sensitivities we had in doing these was we can't literally just say, hey, why don't you just go call the US Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Agency? There's money there, like, good luck. It was about finding actual examples of arts organizations who have been using some cases for many years, tapping into these funds. And if they can do it in any other state, uh, then it can be done in Vermont. And, and I think there's a few examples in here from Vermont. Uh, and um, so these are the six that are coming out. And the other, the one uh, I just had opened up, the one on rural development, it is focused on the community facilities program in the Rural Development Administration. Uh, which is an arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and then um, it goes into, uh, you know, it sort of maps out how this all works. Um, it provides uh, explanation of the, each of the programs and then has examples here. And there's, yeah, so Sharon Academy in Sharon, Vermont is one example of a school in this case receiving uh, this, these funds. Um, through uh, this program. And there's other examples. These are just some of the ones we've given some paragraphs to. Uh, and then we also have links in each one of these things uh, going to the source material. Uh, oh, Rutland uh, as well has a parent center um, that received. And they all have connections to the arts. In this case, uh, I think there was indoor and outdoor spaces for different kinds of uh, cultural uses as well. So that is uh, what I wanted to end with. Um, I will certainly make sure that Amy has uh, this, the links to these when we post them uh, and are able to provide them. They'll be provided for free uh, as the other resource guides have been over the years. And hopefully they will um, set any interested arts organization on a, uh, on a path towards accessing federal dollars for, from non-traditional sources at the federal level. Um, thank you for your time and I'm eager to answer any questions and um, provide further information down the road um, should you have it. Thank you so much, Derek. Um, I, we do have one question that just popped up uh, and encourage others to come through. I also want to uh, let folks know that um, this session and the prior two advocacy sessions that we've held. So we, uh, a few weeks ago, we had one about uh, the ARPA funding and municipalities and the potential there for creative sector investments. And then we kick things off earlier this month with a session about our state uh, agenda this year, our state arts and creative sector agenda this year. Uh, all three of those uh, are on our website. We'll, um, I think one of my colleagues can post that link. There it is. Thank you, Catherine, uh, where you can see the recordings of those past events. And that's where uh, this event, the slide deck and, and the recording will be available there soon. I also want to encourage people to stay up to date um, on uh, advocacy and other arts issues in the state by uh, subscribing to our art mail e-newsletter. And also specifically, we use, thanks to AFTA, we use the voter voice um, platform to send out advocacy alerts to folks and uh, they can sign up. Uh, there's a link in the chat now uh, to sign up for the Advocacy Action Center and to sign up for our art mail so that you can stay well informed. Um, so we have a specific question from Larry around recommend, recommending sources of funding for a Vermont town wanting to partner with a local performing arts group. 
for example, outreach of a nonprofit musical organization. And I know I, I can say from our, the State Arts Council perspective, Larry, that there are some um, arts organization uh, grants available through the Arts Council um, that might be of interest. <clears throat> and I would also, I was just mentioning that advocacy session we had two weeks ago around ARPA funding decisions being made at the municipal level, and there may be opportunities there, but this was not a question for me, sorry. This was a question for Nair. So I don't know if you have, <laughs> have any other thoughts there. Well, uh, it, yeah, I, my, first, my first inclination was um, more on the state level. Um, it is, uh, these, um, I, I mean, I usually say when I'm presenting on these resource guides, uh, that these are not always easy to acquire those funds. It's easy for me to talk about it uh, and sort of like that consultant ad from many years ago on TV where the consultant sort of hands over the plan and says, well, this is, here's your plan. And they're like, great, let's do it. And they're like, well, we don't do the plan. Uh, <laughs> I sort of in the same vein, um, here's the uh, resource guide. Um, there's a limit to how much I can project as uh, success from it we try to show how others have been successful and provide, and they um, are very helpful uh, in explaining how they did it. Uh, in terms of your exact question, the, the community development block grant program uh, is often one that I think of in terms of um, uh, supporting program at the programmatic level in this way for a town to support a um, organization. The, the reason why I say that is because uh, the community development CDBG is what it's called, and it comes from the U.S. Um, Housing and Urban Development Program, uh, is flexible, and it has it is just dis disseminated by formula to every uh, city and uh, state, and depending on the size of the city and the size of the state, uh, state departments of community. Uh, community development department or economic development agencies uh, then are have authority over those programs and that authority can be quite flexible they can decide to do use it in brick bricks uh, you know foundation uh, bricks and mortar type programs um, building infrastructure or they can and I should say and or they could use it for programmatic purposes like the one you're proposing uh, in Colorado for example they use it uh, in Denver, they use it for a microloan program for artists, uh, which is a fascinating use of CDBG program. Uh, and so that's one, um, in a smaller state, the dollars go to the state agency um, uh, for dissemination. And Amy and her colleagues may have more understanding of whether they have the ability to support um, arts organizations through their eligibility guidelines. Uh, but that at the federal level is the one that comes to mind um, that can um, help towns, because you mentioned towns. Uh, so as an actual public agency supporting local uh, performing arts groups. Thank you, Narek. And uh, one question I wanted to pitch, and I'm forgetting, forgive me, it's either the CREATE Act or the PLACE Act that has um, some provisions regarding uh, disaster relief assistance for artists. Uh, and it's something that our friends at SURF Plus, which is a, an amazing national arts organization that happens to be based here in Montpelier have been working on. And I was hoping you might briefly touch on that piece so folks are aware. Yep, uh, Surf Plus has been a, uh, a leader nationally on this exact question. I mean, I, that's what the mission of the organization is, but in terms of federal legislation, uh, they have found and been working with some other uh, disaster related um, organizations on how to address some of the inequities around how artists and arts organizations are treated during times of disaster. Unfortunately, uh, or sadly, I should say, um, in recent years, there have been more disasters that have demonstrated uh, the gaps that artists face, uh, and these are working artists. So the idea here from FEMA, from the Federal Eman uh, Emergency Management Association, or agency, uh, is that they are they have a small business program essentially a small business disaster program but they don't treat small uh, they don't treat artists as small businesses the same way they treat small businesses as small businesses and surplus has found uh has been exploring this examining this and also providing 
some of the policy solutions. And those are uh, those those provisions have been included in a couple of these bills um, that we're trying to move on. And we've been working with some of those uh, uh, senators uh, and House members that are that are on the Homeland Security agencies. Um, I'm sorry, committees in Congress because they can address the, these um, these gaps at FEMA uh, and um, Surf Plus has been I, um, their policy uh, director, Craig Nutt, uh, has been an enormous resource, nationally speaking, uh, to um, addressing this. And uh, I just happen to know that uh, and not everybody knows that I work with that Surf Plus is headquartered in Vermont. And um, I think it's wonderful that it's there. Thank you, Narek. We've got a question about timing and, and approaches. Um, is there a best time of year for federal advocacy? Is there a benefit to in-person advocacy, uh, meaning in DC versus phone or letter? Sure, and, and uh, I think it's a little bit of, a, of an art. Uh, if there's any art in lobbying, this is part of the art. Um, uh, the, um, the outreach in terms of time of the year, um, there's, I was talking earlier about the appropriations cycle. Uh, we hold our National Arts Action Summit every year in the spring in Washington, D.C. When we were able to hold it face to face, it was there uh, for the last, um, you know, for 35 years straight. Uh, and the last two years have been virtual. Uh, and we hold it in the spring because that's the beginning of the appropriation cycle. That's when subcommittees start looking at this stuff and then committees, then it gets to the House floor and then later in the fall, it goes to the Senate. And so we try to be uh, bring advocates to town in a vocal way uh, in the spring. So in March and April, because that's when staff and policymakers on the Hill are thinking uh, in their very first stage of thinking about how much uh, they want to provide in funding. Uh, and then we work throughout the year to try and um, encourage that same message about increasing support for the National Endowment for the Arts. We talk about the National Endowment for Humanities uh, and other federal agencies. Institute for Museum and Library Services is another grant making agency uh, at the federal level. And so we work on those throughout the year. Uh, but starting in the spring. In terms of other legislation, uh, it is uh, a little hit or miss as to when it might take place. You could safely say it's more in the summer and the fall. And certainly uh, sometimes bills, and you can see this happening right now, uh, are left to, towards the end of the year for final passage. Uh, and so there's this big traffic jam of right now ma major issues, uh, but other bills uh, just below those headline items are also uh, stacked up uh, waiting for final action for the year. And if they don't receive it now, this is just the first year, the first session uh, of Congress uh, for, sorry, it's the first year of this session of Congress. The session of Congress is two years. This is the first year, next year is the second. It ends with the, um, there's an election at the end of next year. And then uh, in 2023 would be the next 108th, uh, uh, 118th session of Congress. Uh, and so that is um, uh, maybe a little bit answer oh, around advocacy versus phone or letter. So uh, in Vermont, you'd expect that at some point you go talk to your elected officials. Uh, I mean, you certainly do at the state level, if not weekly, you can do it any other time of the month. Uh, at the federal level, I know that um, obviously the, the uh, the two senators and, and the House member, um, Leahy, Sanders, and Welch have town halls uh, and travel around the state to have different, you know, meetings and such. And there's always town meeting day. Uh, and so in Vermont, that's somewhat of an easy thing to do, relatively speaking. Uh, in larger states, uh, we certainly try and encourage, as Amy just did, the e-advocacy portion of things. The, um, you know, click here, put in your zip code. And here's a suggested message. You could change it to your story uh, and your ask, um, but it is a easy way to use a technology platform to connect you to, to your congressional office. That is how they get most of their, that is how those congressional offices right now get most of their input from their constituents. If you were a Vermonter trying to contact someone from another state, a senator's office, they will most likely block your communication 
because you're not a constituent, just the same way that uh, Senators Leahy and, and, and Sanders and Congressman Welch do that, uh, because it's, you're, they're trying to serve within the contours of their state lines. And so uh, my job, uh, along with the others who are working on this at the national level, is to try and inform you, the advocates, with the right time and the right way and the right message uh, to take action when that can be effective. So I know, uh, because I receive all these kinds of things from interest groups, I'm not spending every week sending messages out. Some people do, uh, but I'm not doing that every, I wanna know when is exactly the right time to weigh in because something could happen uh, in, at the congressional level. And that's what my job is to provide that information at the right time in the right way. And I'm thankful for partners like the Vermont Arts Council and Amy, to host, uh, to be a partner in that kind of e-advocacy so we can do this together uh, as strongly as possible. And we do this uh, with uh, dozens of states across the country um, so that uh, we can continue to have a vibrant, there's a Congressional Arts Caucus that we look to for leadership and there's a Senate Cultural Caucus uh, for which uh, both Vermont senators are members of and, and Congressman Welch is in the Congressional Arts Caucus. So that kind of ask isn't even necessary in Vermont. We, we continue to try and build the numbers uh, from, other, uh, from other states as well. Thank you so much, Narek. Um, we're at time uh, and this has been a, just a wealth of really interesting information and I, I don't envy uh, just how much that you all are, are juggling right now with so much action happening in Congress, but it's so enormously valuable uh, to have folks like you keeping us informed and, uh, and just to, um, you know, for us to continue to be aware that, that we have this privilege in Vermont of, of access to our congressional leaders in, in a way that is a little bit more difficult uh, in some larger places. And, and uh, we can take advantage of that uh, and, and coordinated efforts and uh, personal outreach, um, all of those things, things make a difference. So um, Narek, thank you again. I hope we'll be able to see you in person in Vermont sometime soon. Uh, As do I. <laughs> and uh, we'll continue to keep uh, everyone informed on the issues happening locally on the state level and federally uh, that impact uh, the creative sector. Uh, so again, the recording will be up and available on that webpage. Um, and we thank everybody for joining us and uh, Narek, great to see you and thanks for a great presentation. Great, thank you everybody. Thanks everyone.